So we are continuing on our series, Building the House for Future, and now it's part five. Now before we go into this, remember what uh, Joyce was saying, right, about NetSuite's training. So important for us in this season to deal with whatever uh, issue. Now, of course, we have personal issue, we have decisions we made throughout our life, we have to be accountable, we have to be responsible. But on the other hand, there, there is this generational issue. It is not initially our responsibility, but once you found out what is your generational issue, it becomes your responsibility. So it's not like something you can say, I can always blame my father, my grandfather, or my ancestor. It doesn't work like that. The moment you realize that it's on you, then we just have to find out ways to deal with it, okay? So anyway, really want to encourage you all to, to just sign up. Of course, those of you in KL, we can meet on site here also and just makes the training a bit easier. Okay, coming back to building the house of the future. So part five, we are talking about the convergence, okay? And now I'll, I'll explain a little bit what it means. But remember the series that we've been going through, starting off with building the house, counting the cost. Remember in the Gospel of Luke, uh, Jesus was telling all the followers, all the disciples, no one built a house without first counting the cost, without first assessing the material needed so that's what a quantity surveyor is supposed to do, right? That's what the, the architect was supposed to do. So we count the cost, then we talk about all the issues that will affect the house building this year. We talk about atmosphere, we talk about soundproofing, which is a, a little bit uh, different, maybe a new concept for some of you. Last week we talked about revival fire, but actually it, it is really about uh, developing, sustaining that personal altar. And today we talk about convergence, okay? Everyone says convergence. So it's a word that has many meaning. If you are into leadership training, you are into corporate training, you know, you may have heard this word before. But of course, the, the convergence that we're talking about is different. We're talking about spiritual convergence here. Then um, when, when time becomes available, I'm, I'm going into part seven, going into the seven mountain. In, in fact, I was just thinking I want to continue this series all the way until Passover, okay? So I'm just going to have to think of a uh, new topic to continue. Never done such a long series before, but it seems appropriate for us, right? In a year that is emphasizing house, everyone say house. house. We want to build. Now, it's not like you cannot build the house any other year, but there is a focus that if we don't step into the destiny, so it's very, very similar to our nation right now. There is something that is happening if we don't want to tackle the issue, then it will become a cycle and the next generation will have to deal with it. So better we deal with it, right? All right, so let's just quickly recap. Um, a few weeks ago, House of Revival Fire. Remember, we used this template. Foundation, what are we talking about? We're talking about the personal altar. What, how are we worshipping God? How are we spending time with God? Then in terms of material, it is really at the altar, there is a process of giving and receiving. Now, I want you to really understand this, that even in relationship with God, there is giving and receiving. It's not one way. It doesn't work like that. It's like you cannot just give without receiving and it's the same for God because He is a person. So that's why in all our relationship, it's like that. It, there's a give and take. No one can give or take only forever. The relationship will die. So it happens at the throne of Christ. Then what about workmanship? It's all about how do I keep the fire going? There is a fire and there are things that can extinguish the fire. Maybe it's our busyness, whatever things that distract us. So it affects the quality of the house. So when the fire is not there, the performance is very poor. The, the relationship is not there. Personal touch. We have to reveal the altar because every time we enter into a new season, by the way, we are in a new season right now. What words in the last season may not necessarily carry forward into the next season. So that's where the personal touch comes in. And robustness is really your house. Can it stand the test of time? Can it stand the test of storm? And in order for a personal altar to remain strong, it needs to be part of the house. No lone ranger. We cannot just function on, on our own. You never want to meet people, never want to have a relationship. Then, then we will be just knocked out by the enemy. Okay, so with that, let's come into part five. Building the house or the, for the future. Now, just very quickly, why are we doing this series? It's really to provide big picture. 
So we, so a lot of the things we discuss will be very broad. We are not going into detail. In fact, some of the things I, I share today, we can break into many, many chapters. But I just want to give a very big picture. And if there's a need, we'll go through in detail in weeks to come. So it is in relation to the manner how we are building for this year, payback. Now remember, payback is not just a prophetic picture. It's not just a prophetic portal, but it's a cycle. So what it means by cycle is there is a definite time to fulfill. And if we don't get it done in this cycle, wait for the next cycle. So when will, we, when will the next cycle of house come? I mean, from the prophetic, uh, Hebrew prophetic is 10 years, right? 10 years, right? I don't think you want to wait for 10 years to build. And this year, so interesting, right? I mean, in KL, even in Cebu, so many people are moving house. So many people are renovating house. So it's... It's like what's happening in the prophetic is happening in the natural. So in terms of building, there is the personal level. That means it starts with ourselves, the way we cause our gifts, our destinies to be fulfilled. But there's also the corporate expression. And we're talking about the movement or the tribe. We're talking about eventually we move into the kingdom of God. Now some of you, you understand, you have seen this before, right? We talk about the, the three stages of kingdom expression. You know, maybe you have seen that picture before. It used to be in a ladder. I tried to find the ladder. Actually, I, I found some. It's a super old, so I said, forget it. I'm just going to do a new one. So when we became, when we have a relationship with God, it always starts with personal, right? Start with personal. And we're like, oh, God is great. He's blessing me. So it's like that honeymoon period. I, I don't know if you all can remember. Everything is good. And we are like baby believer. So everything we do in relation to God is from a personal perspective. What can I gain? I want to see the hand of God. I want to see the blessings. I want to see the prosperity. And then the next ladder, the next advancement is we go into church level. I prefer to call the word, I prefer to use the word tribe. Now, why? Because we are in a season where we are shifting from church to kingdom. So that's why I avoid using the word church because it just gives the idea we are like being churchy, we are focusing on fellowship. Not that, not that those things are not important. It's very important, but we are moving on. Everyone says, moving on. So this level is still quite easy because, you know, historically people will be like, oh, I'm a believer now, what can I do? Can I be an usher? Can I play drum? Can I, you know, people will come to recruit you. Seems like you have a gift. Seems like you have a good voice. Seems like you have a lot of money. By the way, it's one of the things that you can give, right? Not, not everyone is blessed with financial prosperity. So it, it is one thing that people can contribute to the corporate, to the tribe, to the church, whatever you want to call it. But then the big challenge, everyone says challenge. And that's what the last 15, 20 years has all been about. From the church mindset to kingdom mindset, that's very difficult. And you will be surprised that how many people can accept the apostolic prophetic but cannot move into the kingdom of God. We have seen it so often and I have to say initially I was a bit surprised. It's like, if you accept the newest move of God, isn't that kingdom? Apparently not. It's not the same thing. So this is the highest level of expression which the Lord is doing right now. He is basically looking around and it's like, who are prepared to advance the kingdom of God on earth? It's that simple. It's not a very complicated thing. So with that, let's talk about convergence, okay? Now, don't, don't be scared by the big word. It's not a very big word, okay? Only, only three sound, right? Convergence, okay? <laughs> so, so we can talk about, uh, you know, I, I talk about you know, leadership stuff and things like that. But here we are talking about a spiritual concept and it's actually, it, it's actually an expression used by Robert Clinton. Now, Robert Clinton, uh, he was a Fuller Seminary professor also. So he wrote a book called The Making of a Leader, a lot of leadership concept, but it's still from a spiritual perspective. So this is how he defined convergence. He said convergence is this, spending most of your time doing what you are good. Sounds good, right? At and going what you are supposed to do. So there are the things we do and there are the things we're supposed to do. Sometimes they are not the same. So, so often we do things, well, not wrong things, but wasteful things. It's like we're going through the wasteful motion. So here's a direct quote from the book. In conversion, God moves the leader, so notice that everyone is a leader, into a role that matches his or her gift mix, 
So the spiritual gift understanding comes in. And experience so that ministry is maximized. Now, some of you will be like, okay, ministry. I don't have a ministry. And I'm just going ahead because later on, we're going to talk about the meaning of ministry. Ministry comes from the word service. Diakonia. That's where, you, that's where we get the word deacon. Everyone who do something for the kingdom of God is doing an act of service. Everyone has a ministry. So that's why this is talking about everyone. That our gift meets can be maximized. Then he continued. The leader uses the best he has to offer. So you do your best. And is free from ministry for which he is not gifted. No gift, don't do. We always say that, right? Ah, but here's a warning. You don't specialize so quickly. How do you know which is your best gift? So that's why in the book, he did say convergence usually, not all the time, around 50 years old. <laughs> How many of you are 50? I'm not even 50 yet, okay? So, but it's not age. It's not age. I believe Timothy reached his convergence way before he was 25. It's not about age, but there's a general guideline. So recently, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the, 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 a person who is a generalist. You know, you try many things, you're good at many things. In fact, that's a good point to start. Don't specialize so quickly. So that's why with this kind of understanding, this is how we can define convergence. In short, it is the final journey of a leader. It's like the, the jewel piece, the, the crown piece of your journey in fulfilling a person's destiny on earth. That's convergence. So it's like, if you haven't tried all the things, you don't know what you're good at, what you're bad at, don't try to say, this is my ultimate spiritual gift. It, is, it can backfire on you very quickly. That's why, you know, if you think about it, children 15, 16, 70 years old are, are, are asked to think about their life career. <laughs> it's just very hard, right? So no wonder these days, it's so common that people graduated and they say, this is not for me. In my generation, it's so rare. In my parents' generation, it's impossible. You do that, I, I know society will be like, you are a waste to society. You know? But it's happening all the time because when, when we understand that there is a destiny, there is a calling, and a person, unless he or she fulfill that, will never be satisfied. Will never be naturally and spiritually satisfied. That's very important. Okay, so... Coming back to the book, in fact, it's a very interesting book. You can buy it on Amazon. One of the person, now he used a few people in the, in the case study, but one of the person he used as case study was Apostle Peter Wagner because he was a colleague and quite close to him. Now, some of you, you know Peter Wagner, right? You know his life story. If you don't know his life story, I strongly encourage you to buy his memoir, Wrestling with Alligators, Theologian, Prophet, or I can't remember the three. We still have a lot of copy. In fact, that is one of the great books, one of the few books I bought it and I finished it in one sitting, okay? So that book is very thick. But when you read through this, a few things very interesting. He had to go through almost 20 paradigm shifts. 20. Some people struggle with one shift. 20. And just to get into that convergence zone, okay? So he tried all kinds of spiritual gifts. Every single one. In fact, he, he, Peter Wagner is most well-known for his books on spiritual gifts. And in fact, he said that he tried everything. Yeah, a wide range. So that's the thing. So what I mentioned earlier on, don't try to limit your exposure and proceed into specialization too early on. Now, some of you, you are very gifted. And uh, I think the challenge is really for those who are gifted in many areas. So just try many, many different things and eventually the process will bring you to a place where you know that two or three gifts are your major kind of thing. So by the time when Apostle Peter Wagner was 50, he had maximized his gifting and he, 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 he finally came to the place and he knew that these two are his main gifting. As a teacher, of course, those of you have heard him teach, like in terms of, of teaching, he, he is always my, my apostolic model in terms of how... We, we want to teach. Then, his gift of apostle is a very unique one. He is a horizontal apostle. What do we mean by that? So, he doesn't have network. He doesn't have many churches under him. For example, Apostle Che Ang will have uh, thousands of churches under him. Peter Wagner has zero. 
But what he does is, he is a convening apostle. He will call a gathering and people will come. So it's like in Acts 15, Apostle James called the council of Jerusalem. Every noted apostles in the whole region came, the Gentiles and the Jews, and they had to resolve a major theological issue. So that's really his role. But it took him 50 years and try all the spiritual gifts. So it's okay, you know. So if you try something for a while and you're like, not really working for me, and, and sometimes not really working for me, you have to de determine that it is because you have put in all the effort and it's still not working for me. If you're not putting the effort, then you can't make the determination. You are not allowed to make that kind of determination. Because you have not given yourself a chance to see whether you can do it. So very important. So that's why we have the safety of the tribe. You can come and try everything and hopefully you get a glimpse. Now, of course, we, we cannot cover everything. There are things in marketplace that you just have to go and do. But as far as the available things are here, try and, and see where you are going. Okay, so that's personal convergence. Now, why do I talk about personal convergence? Because when we are talking about building the house, right, this year, we're talking about the, the corporate side. So, now we understand how personal convergence looks like. How would it look in the context of building the house of God? Because in this re regard, the scope, it extends beyond our individual calling, right? It is more than just our personal destiny. It, we are talking about the destiny of the ecclesia, the destiny of the church. So here's a question. Has the destiny of the ecclesia been fulfilled? It's not a very hard question. It's not a trick question. The answer is a big no. Because when we look at what is the assignment, Matthew 28, 19, you all can memorize this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them. Very interesting. So many people kind of miss that word. How do we disciple nation? Teach them. It's like people have all kind of grand ideas. Do this, plant churches. Oh, okay. But teach them. The teaching component. Teach them what? To observe all that I commanded you. So after more than 2,000 years, we are still looking for the first disciple nation on earth. So what is the missing link? So we know the destiny of the Ecclesia has not been fulfilled. So that's why today, I want to just quickly talk about these, some of the key points that will help us to move into the convergence in terms of the corporate convergence. Okay, before we go further, we need to define the meaning of discipling nations. Because so many people read the verse, right? So if you have, if you have uh, Chinese Bible, for example, that translation is totally wrong. Totally wrong. Because the Chinese translation says, go and make individual disciples in nation. That's wrong. Actually, many languages are like that. And the reason for that is really, historically, people cannot imagine how can you disciple an entire nation. They don't have the concept, okay? So, we need to look at the meaning of nations. It comes from the Greek word ethnos. Okay, give you a clue, right? Ethnos, ethnic. So, English word translated as people, group, or tribe. Other English word you can use, multitude, company, system of community, nation. Now, when you think about nation, is it just a human being? I mean, if it's just a human being, then there's no difference, right? So it's like if it's China or US or Australia, Malaysia, no difference. But nations include their history, their culture, and kaching, kaching, the money, the wealth. So when we say disciple nations, now by the way, this one can easily be one or two teaching, okay? We're just a super summary here. More than just saving souls of individuals within a particular nation. Because we are talking about shifting the whole territory. And that's why just now, you remember, we were prophesying about Borneo. It's like, some people will be like, hello, we have a few countries there. You see, God doesn't look at it like that. He looks he look at it from His point of view. From His point of view, that's one nation and it is that. So we will have to work it out how to align with what heaven is declaring. So it's the territory. Remember in Romans, it says, creation is crying out for the sons of God. So, it's also redeeming creation. It's the culture. Some culture can be redeemed. Some culture cannot be redeemed. So, for example, you have a culture of demon worship. It cannot be redeemed. You have to give that up. 
So that's why when Gideon was called, remember in, in Judges, he had to destroy the altars of his fathers and forefathers. Because there's a lot of contradiction there. The richness of history. Some history can be redeemed, some cannot be redeemed. It's very important we understand this because there are too many Christians who have placed culture above God. And that's going to hinder the advancement of the kingdom. Then final point. If we are only to disciple individual and nations, then how do we explain Matthew 25? Matthew 25 is when Jesus said, I will divide nations into sheep and goat. If it is about people, then just divide the people. Lah. Don't need to divide nations. How do you explain that? How do you explain Psalm 2.8? That nations are inheritance for Jesus. So you see, when, you, when we read the Bible, we need the overall. Everyone say overall. overall. Overall counsel of the Word of God. Then we can come to a conclusion. That's why I'm really uh, glad to see that we have the entire Bible reading plan. And every now and then we will see, oh, somebody obtain a reward again. You know, every now and then, somebody finish a whole Bible in one year. So it's okay. Keep coming, keep coming. The reward will continue, okay? <laughs> because it's good. When you, you read it a few times, all of a sudden when you read the Bible, your perspective is not the same anymore. You have broadened your view because the Spirit of God allows you to see things from a holistic point of view. Okay, moving on. Okay, let's look at another important scripture about the convergence. Remember, we have defined convergence as reaching the destiny, right? So we're talking about the ultimate goal of Ecclesia. And this is where Jesus prophesied the Ecclesia, right? And speaking to the disciples, especially to Peter. And he said, I will build my church, I will all cost my Ecclesia, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. See, this is New American Standard. Much better translation. If you read NIV, you are like a bit confused. It's like, hey, I have the power. You don't have the power. Whatever you have is determined by heaven. One of the signs of convergence is if we are seeing that the Ecclesia is doing what it's supposed to do, we will start to see blessings. We will start to see atmosphere of heaven on earth. That's why it's important. I want to encourage you all to come because what... I mean on site because every time we have Judah, it's a glimpse. It, it, it's, a, it's a shadow. It's not the full picture. But every time we are here and we allow the Spirit of God to lead us in terms of worship, we are experiencing a small part of what heaven looks like. A small part only. It's not a major part. But if we cannot even understand the small part, how can we begin to affect the atmosphere in the marketplace? We can't. That's why don't underestimate this kind of thing. Now, this is not the only way you can worship. You can worship in front of your computer all by yourself. You can, you can. But when you are here, you start to have an appreciation of what that tiny bit looks like. So how do we measure convergence? Now we're talking about KPI, okay? God has a KPI. And I remember when I first get into the apostolic property, I remember the apostles were saying, the sign of transformation is elimination of systemic poverty. I, I couldn't understand it at all. I said, why is that important? Why is that important? Isn't that the job of the government? So, but you see, the last few years, we, have, we started to see that the government is not interested in eliminating poverty. Even the so-called mature democracy, they are not interested. But God is interested because in kingdom, in heaven, there is no poverty. So the measurement of convergence, how do we know that the kingdom of God has advanced? There will be elimination of systemic poverty. You know what is systemic poverty? That means the system causes people to be poor. Whether it's poor in, in, in their education, it's poor in the, in the natural things, in money, or poor in health. I, I mean now, health cost is a big topic in, in this era. And they start to say, oh, if you don't do this, we will not pay for your health and things like that. All, all, all these kind of nonsense are coming. So that's why systemic is when the system is designed and rigged to disadvantage you. So that's why the measurement of convergence, when the heaven is on earth, this kind of thing will be eliminated. But more important is that there will be a genuine freedom of religion. There will be a genuine ability to make choices. So how much is this freedom of religion? So much that we can even choose to go to hell. That, that is the level of freedom that we're talking about. 
I'm not going to talk too much on that because that's an entire topic altogether. But let's move on to, to this point. How can we then assess the keys of the kingdom? Because when we are fighting the gates of Hades, right, it's the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, I will give you, right? So there are two things, you know, we're talking about again. Now, the whole series on building the house for God, we always have to have two mindsets. One is personal level. What should we do at our own individual level? Then the corporate level is always side by side. You cannot say, I want to do it my own way and I don't care about other people. And you can't say, I'm part of the group, but I don't care about my own destiny. Both are fatal, okay? So let's look at individual. We talked about this last week uh, when we talked about abounding grace. Ephesians 2, verses 5 to 7. And this is one of the most amazing promises, I feel. Made alive, you know, after we receive Christ, we'll make alive together with Christ, raise us up with Him. It's not like you're on the cross and you die with Him, no. But you are, it's like He has made you having that access to grace. And seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, let me ask you, is it now? It's not future, okay? You are not going to sit with Him in the future. I mean, unless you have done well and you receive the reward, you know, all different kind of assignment. But right now, we have a glimpse in the heavenly places. So that in the ages to come, talking about the future, He might show the surpassing riches of His grace. So it's like God wants to give us the grace, the understanding, the keys to heaven. So how do we do that? It's accessing the throne room and we have access to God directly. So that's why every time we pray, especially when we speak in tongues, there is that connection there. That's why the personal altar becomes so important. And it's like, why some people you talk to them feel like, you know, they've been with God and other people you feel like you're talking to a rock or talking to a stone. And even though they say they are believer, even though they have Holy Spirit, they can speak in tongues, they can prophesy, but it's like they haven't been to the throne room. They haven't been to a place of revelation. Then from a corporate point of view, now remember in the book of Revelation, uh, you know, after John was, you know, brought to a place and all of a sudden Jesus began to talk to him, right? And he said, I've been talking to the churches. And this is the, the beginning of many cycle of exhortation. Remember this, this verse, he said, Revelation 2, 7, Jesus is talking to the ecclesia. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And he repeat this a few times, right? Every time he was talking to a particular church, you know, of the seven church in Ephesus, he will end with this. So what it means is that there is such a thing called corporate revelation. Corporate revelation is given to Ecclesia by the Spirit of God. And this, that is what it means by present truth. When we study church history, we understand present truth. In every generation, God will cause the truth to rise up once again. He will use anyone he wants. He can even use a donkey if he wants, okay? But he used anyone he wants and then a simple truth will become a movement. And that's how church history, the last 500, 550 years of restoration. So, I want to finish off by just going through a, a few points, which now corporate convergence is a huge topic we can't possibly cover all. But I want to talk about a few things which I believe we can begin to push through that will help us to be part of this expression. Okay, the first one is we have to understand the priesthood and ministry of all believers. So a lot of these are paradigm shift. A lot of these are the battle in your mind. That first, there is an understanding and then we have to embrace what the Spirit of God is saying. So often is people will tell you something and you'll be like, yame, yame, that kind of thing. And, and you kind of like don't want to believe but, but we are talking about paradigm shift here. Then, of course, we talk about the church mindset to kingdom mindset. That, that's really a huge one. And finally, there has to be a maturing of the marketplace church. We talk about micro church a few times already, but I, I just want to give some pointer here today. So these are the three things I want to talk about, then we will finish already. Now, let's talk about priesthood and ministry of all believers. If you study church history, if you, are, if you come from a particular denomination, mainline denomination, then you will, we will all know Luther's Reformation. Even in Malaysia, history book, we, have, we talk about Martin Luther, right? I think just one paragraph. <laughs> but he restored a very important biblical understanding. Now, of course, he talked about salvation by faith, etc., etc. But one of the other things that he really brought forth is the priesthood of all believers. So what is the priesthood of all believers? 
in very simple terms, when we embrace the cross, we have access directly to God. See the, the whole thing, right? The, the whole symbolism of cross is like, there, there's, a, there's a relationship between God and human and all of a sudden, you know, we are able to have that link with Him. So when we have the priesthood of all believers, we do not need an intermediary. <clears throat> you know, sometimes you want to do something, you need an agent, you need a broker, you need an introducer. Like even sometimes some bank, bank when you open an account, they say, anyone introduce you? Don't have? Okay, cannot open a bank account. So we don't need all this intermediary to function as priests. We are all priests. We can connect directly with God. Can you connect with God? It's not like, cannot connect. It's not like those old days, the modem, you know, you dial 1511 jarring. Anyone you said before? <laughs> did, 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 did. Cannot, cannot connect. But it's not like that. Now it's like always on. Always on data. We can even be advocates and intercessors. Not only can you talk to God, you can talk to God about other people. That's what intercessors do, right? That's why intercessors sometimes can be very busy body. <laughs> so that's why the sphere became very important. <laughs> it's true, it's true. You know, they are some of the most busy body people on earth, broadly speaking. But when they function within their sphere, they fulfill their role, their kingdom role. Yeah, some gifts are kepo gifts, okay? Yeah, kepo. Actually, if you function within your sphere, that's not capable, right? That's your role. That's your task. But if you are... Okay, I'm going to leave that to the people. Okay. Now, now the, the, thing about, the thing about restoration of truth, and one point I want to make is really this, that every time there's a restoration of truth, we talk about church history many, many times previously, but it's a good reminder that, like for example, Luther. Luther represented one movement, but it's only one part of the overall picture. Why do we have so many denominations today? It's because every time people receive a present truth, they treat it as the ending point. They treat it as the final package. But it's only one step of many steps. So it's very important we understand this. Now, why do I talk about priesthood of all believers? It's because even though Luther restore that, but he didn't restore the concept of ministry for all believers. Because what he did not do was to break the false division between clergy and laity. Now, we talked about this previously, but basically clergy are the higher class, are the educated ones, are the ministry. That's why for the longest time, people fear the word ministry. It's like if you say, I have a ministry, people will be like, oh, so you are a pastor? So, are you a missionary? Oh, no, no, no. I'm just a tech team. <laughs> See, it's like, whatever you do that is not pastor or missionary, you feel like you are not a minister. Now, I'm just making fun of tech team, but, but tech team is one of the most hard, hardest working team in, in our place. And, and that's a ministry. That's a service. You see, the old system is a great mindset. It's a duology. It creates different class of service and ministry. That's why, you know, many of us came from Methodists, right? So Methodists would be like, oh, if you are a full-time pastor, well, great, great, great. Yeah. Almost like angel level. <laughs> but if you are a missionary, you can be a junior art angel, okay? <laughs> but anyway, I'm just joking. Okay? But it's like, you know what, what I'm talking about? That there is classes, whether it's man-made, whether it's our own understanding. Actually, I remember this. I, I told this story many times already. But when I was starting to become serious with God at university level, and I was like, yeah, I, I really want to do everything for God. But I know I don't want to be a pastor. I don't want to be a missionary. I don't want to be a full-time minister. And here we have a guest speaker. We'll be like, whoever wants to be full-time for God, uh, come out, I want to pray for you. Then I was like, okay, why not? Then he has to add the word and say, oh, I mean full-time as in you work for the church. No thanks. I sat down. Because I was so convinced that the ministry is for all believers. But you'll be surprised at how many try, how many systems, how many denominations are still stuck in this. The Greek word for ministry is diakonia. That's where we get the word deacon. 
That's where we get the concept, work or service. The first time deacon is mentioned, they are to serve the widow. They are to serve food. You are supposed to do some work. So contrast from the teachers of law, from the Pharisees, right? They were like sitting there and expecting people to serve them. So very different. So in another place, we see this concept, Ephesians 4, 12. And of course, the, the earlier part is talking about the fivefold, the apostles, prophets, etc., etc. And then what is their role? For the equipping of the saints for work of service. Here is the same word, diaconia. Okay, let me ask you a question. Who is supposed to do the work of service? I hope you don't say you, okay? It's all of us, okay? All the things. So there's no such thing as you volunteer for other people. Some people like to volunteer other people, right? You can't, you can't. Yet at the same time, the Ecclesia, even after the Reformation, they struggle to embrace this concept for many hundreds of years. Even today, so many people are, are like, I can't do this. I need the pastor to pray for me. I can't even pray for myself. Right? So many... Uh, I mean, if, even the charismatic is it, quite unbelievable that you go to a church... I, I mean, I'm not talking about all, but I'm talking about some. That you'll be like, oh, you know, can you pray for me to be filled with Holy Spirit so that I can receive the gift of time? And you know what they'll do? Oh, okay, wait. We need to arrange for the pastor to do it for you. It's very common. It's more common than you think. But everyone, Mark 16, all those who believe... Speak in tongue, lay hands and people will be healed. Dream poison and will not die. Cast out demon, all who believe. Mark 16. And much, much, much more, okay? So that's why, even though the Ecclesia is struggling with this concept, but the law is moving us to a place where the new saints movement will truly begin. So what's happening, of course, is that, you know, sometimes God will do one move and He will do another move and all of a sudden He will need to, to kind of converge. He will kind of merge the move. So we have the marketplace move which took place after World War II. So we have the full gospel man and all those kind of things, which was good, but it was not complete because it did not have the apostolic move. The old marketplace move, basically what they try to do is they try to bring Sunday church to marketplace. Let's do a praise and worship here. Let's do prayer meeting here. Let's do Bible study here. Anyone tried that before? I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. Don't, don't, don't quote me on that. But that is not what God is doing. So when the apostolic move came, God just kind of say, let's combine this into the saints movement. Now some of you have heard about the saints movement. If you want to read more about that, you can read Bishop Bill Hammond, The Coming of the Saints. Very thick. His book, always very thick, okay? But here's a one-line summary. According to Bishop Bill Hammond, it is a grassroots movement. Very interesting, right? Do you, do you find it very interesting that he wrote this more than 10, 15 years ago? Grassroots movement spiritually, but what we're seeing right now worldwide is a grassroots movement naturally. They will shift the ecclesia away from superhero model of the past. So worldwide... Society are shifting away from the superhero politician model. You see, the, the era of, you know, I was just reading the other day about J.F. Kennedy. Right? Now, J.F. Kennedy, of course, he was, he was a Democrat, but he was not like the Democrat of now. In fact, when Kennedy came about in the 60s, he was admired by people all around the world because they considered, now, of course, they, they didn't really know his family history, all that kind of thing. But from the outward Look, he looked like someone that is very reasonable. He looked like a fighter for freedom. And most of all, people began to dream because he had this... You know what was his greatest desire? His greatest desire was the moon program. He wants to send human to moon. So when he gave that uh, speech at University of Rice at Houston, and, and that's why Houston, uh, Texas, become the, one of the major sites for NASA. Because they, he gave a speech and then all of a sudden an entire generation of young people started to say, we want to study science, we want to study engineering because we want to help Kennedy to put man on moon. So do you know that when the Apollo program finally reached moon, 
in the command room, more than 95% of the crew are less than 30 years old. Yeah, it's a shocking, it's an amazing revelation. It's like everything they do is groundbreaking. Nobody has done it before. And they don't know if it will work. So if you're an astronaut, you already signed a paper say that if something happened and we have to leave you on moon, good luck. Really? I mean, all of them, they are prepared to die. Because nobody has done it before. So this is very interesting, right? So this is what we call the superhero model. It's good, but God is saying, I'm moving away from that. I'm moving away from that because the least of you, the least of you is greater than John the Baptist. We're entering into that era right now. So that's why the saints movement is not going to be controlled by denomination. It's not going to be monopolized by a particular spiritual group. So that's why I say even those who say, oh, we are the apostolic prophetic people, we don't have monopoly over this. Because so many apostolic prophetic people are not accepting the kingdom. So in fact, you have, I've seen people from traditional tribe. They are more kingdom than apostolic prophetic people. So it's no longer about, you see, in the past, we used to talk about, do you speak in tongue? You know, we, we, we divide people by tongue speaking and non-tongue speaking. Then we, we move into the prophetic, apostolic. Then we divide people into, oh, are you the AP or not? Now it's really talking about, are you kingdom-minded? Are you kingdom-motivated? And, and really, in the last two years, we have seen that even those from traditional tribe and wine skin, they are stepping out into the kingdom expression. So the saints movement, it will cause a development of a new marketplace move. You see, every time, there needs to be a new move because the old cannot be used already. It's that simple. It's not very complicated. So when we talk about new, it means it's unlike anything we have seen in the past. And one of the criteria really is we're going to see genuine marketplace apostles. See, now we have a lot of apostles who say they are somewhat linked with marketplace. They are not marketplace apostles. They are apostles, maybe in Apostolic Center, maybe in Religion Mountain, but somehow they have people linked with the Seven Mountain. These are not marketplace apostles. We are talking about people who are genuinely called first and foremost in the marketplace, and they are expressing that gift. Now, of course, when we talk about apostles, we also include the prophets, the evangelists, the teacher, the pastor. It's the whole fivefold. So I think we haven't really seen that yet, right? Would you agree? Have you seen a lot of genuine marketplace five four ministers? So, so we're in that process and it's very exciting. But now you can see why people maybe is against this because this is a total change from the religion mountain structure. It used to be, oh, you know, you can do whatever you want, but spiritually, you have to come back to the house, you know. You, know? you have to report to us. So that's the mindset. I, I can understand why it's not easy. So when Jesus went into the marketplace, ate with sinners, talked with anyone he wants, even slept in some of the sinners' house, John the Baptist became crazy. He couldn't handle it. So I really feel like this is the kind of paradigm shift that is happening and it's going to happen in this pay decade, okay? Okay, so let's quickly move on. Church mindset to kingdom mindset, we already talked about this for a while, but that's really the transition that the body of Christ, the ecclesia, we had to go on through the last 10, 15 years. So I mentioned already apostolic prophetic people. Many of them, they, they move into here, but they cannot accept the transition from church to kingdom. Now don't get me wrong. When we talk about the church, when we talk about the tribe, when we talk about the building, anointing, oil cost, is very important. We can't do without that. Because this is the place we are getting prepared, we are getting equipped, we are getting launched, right? So we can't do without this. We cannot just throw someone... Uh, without any training into the marketplace, it will be quite disastrous, right? So unless you are prepared to do, I don't know, resuscitation or some kind of healing and restoration for the next five to ten years, better not throw anyone who, who are not prepared to go into there. However, everyone says however. <laughs> the battlefield, the place we fight for harvest, the place we fight for souls and nations, it is not the church. It is not the oil cost. It is not here. Because where is the battlefield? It is the marketplace. It is in all the seven mountains. It is within proximity. You know the, the concept of proximity? You have to be close. Close to what? The power and influence of hell. That's what we are fighting for, the redemption. And so many people are like scared. How, how do we fight hell? 
But I thought Jesus already said, all authority has been given. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I mean, didn't he say that? I mean, he, he prophesied that in Matthew 16 before he even went to the cross. After the cross, he said once again, all authority I give to you. So we have the means, but somehow the theology has kept us sort of wanting to go back to the walls of church. This is one of the biggest challenges for, for us to shift from church mindset to kingdom mindset. Now I want to talk just quickly, very quickly about micro church. Okay, I, I've done a few teaching already. The, the last uh, pretty comprehensive one, I was just looking at all the old video is, I think last year, not last year, this year, was still 2021, okay. This year, Passover, okay. So Passover, I, I did one teaching, so I think you can go to YouTube and find. But we asked this question, which we already answered this now. What comes to your mind when we think about Marketplace Church, okay? So a few things, it is not, it is not about transplanting church, Sunday church to office, okay? So there's somebody, some of you will be like, okay, okay, we can do church on Monday. Okay, bring all the musicians, bring all the instruments, bam, 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 bam. So can you imagine if your office with the lobby, you know, 9 a.m., a lot of people, and all of a sudden, the whole band comes. Somebody with a, with a, with a deacon collar or whatever. <laughs> Just disastrous. It is not even about insisting overt expression of Christian faith. Now, we're not saying that you become a pretender, but you don't need to tell everyone that you are a believer. But at the right and opportune time, you are to minister. You are to bring blessing. So that's why I remember the gospel. And so recently, I just go through the whole gospel of Luke. And so often, Jesus was talking about, you are doing this for sure. You are doing this because you want to tell people how religious you are. And I'm going to judge you. So often. So I'm not saying it's, it's wrong. Don't get me wrong. Feel free to share whatever you want to do. But just be aware that you need to hear from God. So we're not talking about all these things. It's not even about doing Bible study or even sharing gospel to unbelievers. Can you do that? Of course you can. But you know some people, they will, they will just keep on sharing, sharing the gospel until people are put off by it. Do you know people like that? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we all know people like that. So, I'm not saying all these things are wrong. I'm not. But I'm just saying that the goal is bigger than that. The goal is really, we are fighting for the right atmosphere. Our public and pu private worship is going to affect the place. That cause people to have an opportunity to one kingdom. That's the goal. That's the goal. So, can we, so the question is really this. Can we create an atmosphere that glorifies the Lord, which in turn allowed the manifestation of the goodness of heaven on earth? That's the goal. So that's different from doing church in marketplace. Instead of thinking about doing church, we need to think about how do we bring the presence of God to our workplace? Very different question, very different preposition. Now some of you may, you may be thinking, oh, you know, I want to learn more about this, I want to read more about this. Uh, and now, Ed Servoso, some of you have, have read his books. He has written a few, uh, Anointed for Business, etc. Some, some really good books that will really help us to have some kind of uh, foundational understanding, okay? Of course, we can teach more on this in days to come. So I'm just going to quickly, uh, the last, last one or two slides, I'm going to talk about microchurch. We talked about it many times already. Just a quick summary. But microchurch, this is where the Lord is causing us to have a different kind of expression. So it's like here, we have organized church. Every Sunday, 10 o'clock, if you come, you know something is happening, right? But if we have a microchurch, it's more organic. It's based on relationship. There's no fixed time one. We can be meeting Monday, 9.30 p.m. We can be meeting Tuesday, 5 a.m. It doesn't matter. It's based on relationship. It's very organic. And the way, the functioning, the expression, it is based on the recognition of anointing. People can recognize, hey, this person has a higher anointing. So, for example, we talk about Wilberforce, the, the whole microchurch, full of influential people. Why? Because all of them recognize that Wilberforce has the anointing and they want to help him to end slavery legally in England. So that's the thing. So, so David, for example, David, remember when, when the 40 distressed man came to him. Who was he? Of course, he had been anointed by Samuel, but he was a nobody at that time. He was still being chased around. And at one stage, they all want to kill him. 
But nevertheless, they recognize there's something about this person and they want to follow him. So that's why the way microchurch is organized is very different. I cannot just say, you, 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 form a microchurch. It doesn't work like that. It has to be like, hey, this person really has an anointing. Think about it. Maybe you can learn something from him or her. And really, after that, something is developed. So, we use the word organic. Basically, it means that we cannot assign you to a particular group. And you just have to spend enough time with that person. Maybe you catch something. And then, yeah, it can happen. So, in micro church, what you need to have is the founder and initiator type. That means the person who is called to organize. The person who is called to mobilize. This is an apostolic function. Founder is always an apostolic function. Now, that's why not everyone is called to start organization. A lot of people are called to support. A lot of people are called to manage. A lot of people are called to bring in other people, the evangelists. Evangelists just bring in the people that they are not bothered about building the rest of the house. So you think about it, it's like just those people who bring in the supply. You know some people, some, some of the organization you have building the uh, buying department, you know? And, and during the lockdown, the buying department really can work from home. Man. And they'll buy anything and everything under the sun. But then you ask them, what do we do with that? Oh, don't ask me. The person who receives the thing will have to use it. So the evangelists are like that. They bring all the material, but they're like, not my problem anymore. <laughs> really not the problem of evangelists. The one to build out it, are, are the teacher, the prophet, the apostle, the, you know, the pastor. So the different gifting all come together. But when we talk about microchurch, the founder, the initiator, we have biblical example, Nehemiah, David, Paul. Apostle Paul is very interesting because he really showed the hybrid between the religious center and marketplace. In the beginning, he was with Church of Antioch, then he'd go to many, many different churches. But towards the end, he began to, found, he began to find marketplace people, Priscilla, Aquila, and, and all those people who are like, who are tent makers, who are like businessmen. And, and they, they really, when I look at Acts again, I, I really saw that he was moving into the marketplace much faster and more than what most people will recognize. We are like, oh, you know, he is very religious. He is not. He is like one of the most innovative person in the whole Bible. Now, the other thing about microchurch is very important. The emphasis is not on fellowship and support. So for the last two years, now we really, you know, remember the lockdown and things like that, really no place to go and yam cha and things like that. So that's actually a good thing, right? That people start to learn how to have different kind of fellowship and support. It doesn't have to be he ha he ha kind of thing. Because that's not a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you cannot go yam cha. Don't quote me on that. But it's like, but what's happening is this, that, you know, Apostle Paul say, all things are permissible. You can do all things. All things are lawful. But you have to ask whether it's beneficial. So I would say supper fellowship is in that category. You have to make a determination. Now, I don't want you to be anti-social. I don't want you to be like, her my, hey, Jerry, I haven't seen you for one year. We don't want this kind of uh, happening. But, but you know what I mean or not? You know, sometimes we're just hanging out for the sake of hanging out. No purpose, no goal. Now, sometimes it's okay. But if that's your pattern, if that's your lifestyle, then something is wrong, right? So it's not about fellowship, it's not about support, even though those are important. At different stage of our journey, sometimes we need more support. Sometimes we need more fellowship. So those are the pastoral function, the deliverance function, but it's not a micro church function. So what is micro church? The emphasis is on promoting and executing kingdom agenda. That's why when you are in micro church kind of setting or relationship or meeting, you know, don't feel like, oh, how come people are not talking to me? How come people are not showing me some? It's because we are promoting kingdom agenda. No time to talk about your personal well-being. Your personal well-being, please join a Bible study. Please join a, I don't know. Okay, maybe Bible study is not the right place. But... <laughs> You know what I mean? We, we, there, there are places for pastoral support. It's not a micro church. Because the angle. That's why. That's why we all have different gifts. 
Some people can, can minister pastorally much better because that's their anointing, that's their gifting. And they have to continue to do that. But other people can't do it and, and they have to do other things. Angle is all the same. We are all here together because we want to cause nations to be disciples. Okay, finishing already. I'm just going to give you a quick summary. This is a, this is a summar, summary I put in, in the Passover teaching. Very quickly, just compare micro church with the normal church. So with the gathering church, we think about Sunday, we think about events, like next week, event. You know, event is good. I mean, once in a while, events are good, right? Conferences. But micro church is not about all these things. It's, it's any place in Seven Mountain. Any place you've been called. Gathering is very overt. We can have stadium meeting, concert, charities, community focused work, soup kitchen, whatever. Yeah, some of you maybe want to do soup kitchen. Why not? Okay, maybe maybe not soup kitchen in Malaysia. I mean, Roti China Station or whatever. <laughs> Nasi Lemak Station. <laughs> but micro church is more covert. We are businesses. We are more governmental. We are in arts and entertainment. We do media. We do podcasts. We do consultant, consultation, things like that. We are still advancing the kingdom, but we are not so obvious. Because in Seven Mountain, especially, depending on which nation in Malaysia, it has always been challenging but all around the world, do you realize that the expression of kingdom people are being constrained, being limited? Even in nations like Australia and US, it is happening. There is a global spiritual warfare right now. Then what is the goal? In church, in the oikos, it's fellowship, it's support, come for prayer, it's okay. Now, it doesn't mean we don't do all this thing in micro church, but the goal is a bit different. It's more about strategy. It's all about expansion. How do we influence the marketplace even more? So when people have an assignment, people want to write a paper, people want to do a research, then we'll be like, okay, how can we get your paper published? How can we get newspaper to interview you? How do we increase the social media, the podcast, for example? I mean, these are the things that we are really doing right now. Then you talk about church. We focus on the gospel of salvation. We have evangelists. They, they bring in people. Very important. By the way, uh, feel free to bring people here all the time. So, so every, most of the time when we don't have training, I think a lot of people will stay for lunch and things like that, right? <laughs> so that's one of the highlights for some people. <laughs> but by the way, if you bring a new people, let us know. We'd like to invite the person to stay back for lunch just to get to know us a bit better and things like that. So talk to Joyce, talk to myself, and, and we can arrange for that, okay? But in a micro church, we are more focusing on the gospel or kingdom. So we still have evangelists, but they are more, their, their progression, the things they do are more related to discipling nation. They will be more like, how can we evangelize to entire arena? How can we influence group of doctors? How can we influence university students? You know, they are thinking more in terms of the collective. So gathering, the church usually is peaceful, it's coexisting, but micro church it's very aggressive. It's very challenging. Not challenging to the micro church. We are challenging society. Because we want society to look more like the kingdom of God. Here's a very important thing. We don't force people. What we do is we present a superior model. And we'll be like, this is kingdom. Do you like it? This is the way to influence people. And that's why in the early church, in Ephesus, we know Ephesus probably is one of the first disciple city in the entire world. Ephesus, during the time of Paul and Timothy, was the fourth largest city in Europe. By AD, uh, almost 100. I think the historian was saying that Christians are everywhere. Christians are everywhere in, 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 and they are low-abiding, they are contributing to society. Everyone wants to follow the way. That's how, they, that's how the historian call Christians, the way. Now, if you want more teaching on microchurch, uh, you know, we have a more comprehensive one, Passover this year, but I think we'll do another one, okay? Just to update. So to sum up, house or convergence. What is the foundation? Foundation is always the same. The revelation. We need to know what we are called to first personal level. That's why we focus so much on hearing the voice of God, getting yourself clean up, because at the end of the day, nobody can tell you what you're supposed to do. You have to hear from God. Everyone else can encourage you, 
can kind of say, maybe this, maybe that. You want to try this, this, this. I mean, so many people you can talk to. If you have not tried anything, easily here you can try five or six different things. Then there's a corporate side. And that's why from time to time, and I really feel like the season is now that we have to begin to draw down the corporate word for our nation and release it out. Now, we've been doing that a while. Uh, remember before the last general election, we did quite a lot of that. Um, but I really feel like it's time to do it again. We, we sort of have become a bit slumber and relax. Eh. Remember, we did a lot of prayer war and things like that. And, and you know, I, I remember discussing with Apostle Michel, it, it's like we need to just have that intercessory message out there. So I think the time is now again that the corporate revelation has to be released, has to be judged and released out. What are the material? What is my ministry? You have a ministry. I have a ministry. What is your act of service? So the whole process of reaching the personal convergence, it has to start now. Now, of course, the earlier you start, the better. I'm not, remember, we're not saying everyone must reach 50 years old to reach convergence because some people found their convergence very, very early on. Even you can say someone like Prophet Jeremiah, he found his convergence at 16 years old. Remember, God was telling him, I call you before you were born. It's like, okay, lah, start with that. <laughs> but it's okay. You know, some people know it, but for other people, like, like Moses, like that, struggle for 80 years. It's okay. It's different. But find out what is your act of service, what is your ministry. Don't be afraid to use the word ministry. This is my ministry. Workmanship, am I expressing kingdom? Remember, we talked about the three levels, personal, tribe, and kingdom. So a lot of people, personal, oh, no problem, I, I'm reaching my de destiny. Oh, I'm doing something in the church, I'm doing something in the tribe. But kingdom, a lot of times people struggle with this concept. How am I contributing to the kingdom? So that's the workmanship. What about personal touch? What is my assignment and sphere? So this is related to the foundation. The, you see, foundation is a revelation, but assignment is a bit different. Here you get into the detail. It's like, what do you need to do? Do you need more training? Do you need to change your job? Do you need to change the place you are living? Do you need to move somewhere? Do you need to start a relationship? Do you need to start a relationship? By the way, relationship is an assignment. Don't get too religious. Don't get like, oh no, that's a different category. It's not, it's untouchable by God. Because so many people, it's like this, like, the relationship part is, God, you shouldn't interfere with the relationship. No, that's part of your assignment. I tell you that if you mess up your relationship, especially in terms of spouse relationship, you can get stuck for a long time. Finally, robustness. Always the same. You cannot be alone. You cannot be Lone Ranger. At some point, if you want to move into the Seven Mountains, you have to find a microchurch. So who are my microchurch? And, and really, the last governmental microchurch uh, gathering, I, I think Lyra was just sharing. Uh, you know, one of the points she shared, quite interesting, because I thought about that for, for a while. So the last 10, 15 years, where people come and go, come and go. And, you know, Apostle Michelle and I, we always talk about, you know, would there be people that is going to covenant with us, with each other. You know, we're going together in a long-term kind of journey. And I believe there are people that God will put into your life as covenant. I mean, husband and wife, you, you are in a covenant whether you like it or not. There's no option. So what, what's the expression? Good soul are not refundable. <laughs> but that's really covenant, right? You, you can't break a covenant. And remember Joshua, right? Joshua did a bad covenant. And later on, cannot attack the people, cannot get rid of them. Guess what? He's stuck with it. So that's why covenant is so important because that's how God wants to relate with us. When He created Adam and then Eve and then to start a new um, creation on earth and then mess up in Genesis 3. I mean, what's option one? Option one, just blow a nuclear bomb and start another new earth. That's quite easy. <laughs> or, or, or option two, remember that He is a God of covenant and I'm going to see it through. So even though if He caused my own son to come to the cross, I'm going to make the covenant work. So that's how covenant is, you know. And when we think about 
what's happening in, in our nation, in 1963, all those kind of things. There is a covenant. The covenant has been super messed up. But the question is, what are we going to do about it? That is the question for this season. So Lord, right now, I just pray that as we begin to hear this, you cause us to have an understanding what it means for us to reach the point of convergence. And right now, Lord, I ask that you help us individually and corporately. Help us to reach the point of convergence for the ecclesia. Help us to begin to redeem and cause this land to be part of your inheritance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.